Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Wallace Collection online, and uh, welcome to the Meet the Expert talk uh, for August. Uh, today, I'm uh, delighted to be joined by not one, but uh, five of our curators from the Wallace Collection. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll make a start in just a few moments time. Uh, but before we do, a few bits of housekeeping as always. Firstly, to say, if you need uh, closed captions, uh, we are offering um, live captioning service on Zoom. Uh, all you need to do is select that uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen and you should receive uh, live captioning throughout. Uh, and of course, if you uh, are listening along on Zoom or YouTube, uh, we will be having a Q&A session at the end of today's talk. So make sure to get those questions and comments in either via the chat or the Q&A on Zoom uh, or the comments section on YouTube. And uh, I'll be keeping an eye on those and passing them on to our curators a little later on. Uh, finally, just to say, uh, of course, we're all joining from uh, all over the UK at the moment. So with a lot of our curators uh, joining remotely, not necessarily from the Wallace. Uh, so please do bear with us uh, with regards to internet. Might be a little different uh, all, over, all over the country. So with all of that out of the way, please allow me to hand over to Natalia Munoz Rojas, uh, your host for today's talk. Over to you, Natalia. Thank you, Oli. Um, welcome everyone to this month's Meet the Expert talk. So since the start of this series in November 2020, different members of the curatorial team have presented on their area of expertise, taking turn and one taking each month. Uh, but since we're in the middle of the summer, we decided to do something slightly different. And we decided it'd be a good opportunity to have a more relaxed talk where you'd have a chance to meet some of the curators in the team. So I am joined today by the head of the department and the curator of uh, French paintings, Yuriko Jacko, by the curator of Arms and Armour, Toby Capwell, by Arthur Bill, the Hutton Mac Roberts assistant curator of Ottoman Middle Eastern and Asian Arms and Armour, so long name, and by <laughs> Felix Dorto, the curatorial assistant and temporary cover for 18th century decorative arts. So I'm Natalia Muñoz Rojas and I joined the Wallace Collection two years ago as the Enriqueta Harris Frankfurt curatorial assistant. And needless to say, things have not really gone as planned because I hadn't really planned for a global pandemic that would make us all work from home and close the museum. Regardless, these two years have been fantastic, but I do feel like I have missed out on just working side by side with the other members of the curatorial team and on having the little conversations that, where you learn about how they um, arrived to that, this point in their career, how they chose, the, they chose their area of specialism and um, how they, they became interested in art. So I invite you today to join us in this conversation and um, to learn about how uh, the different members of the team decided to uh, become curators. The, working as a curator is quite a niche job and not an obvious career choice. So I just wonder if there's anything that we have in common as to how we arrived to working in the arts. And my first question is to Yuriko. And I was just wondering, Yuriko, if you have a first memory of a museum or an art institution. Thank you, Natalia. And first of all, thank you so much for putting this talk together today. Um, it's been great. And like you, I've really missed, you know, the day-to-day -day conversations with colleagues. So this is such a pleasure, even though it's, um, even though it's still remote, but hopefully not for long. Um, so yes, I do have some very strong memories of museums. Um, I grew up in New York City, um, which has a lot. And um, I guess my first kind of, I don't know, um, spiritual home, I would say, is the um, Frick Collection and the Fragonard Room, which if you want to advance um, slide, um, uh, the, yeah, so the Fragonard Room at the Frick Collection, which I'm sure as many of our viewers know, um, unites the paintings that Fragonard made for Madame du Berry in this spectacular space. Um, this is a space that I always saw as very kind of calming and joyous growing up. However, 
Uh, the Frick collection does not allow visitors under the age of 13, um, unlike the Wallace, I should say. And um, so I think my first kind of immediate memory as a child was actually the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, right down the street from the Frick, um, where my parents signed me up for art classes quite young. Um, my favorite parts of the collection at this point, surprisingly, given my subsequent specialty in European painting, were actually not the European paintings galleries, but rather Arms and Armor, um, which we'll be hearing more about very shortly. Um, and I was very happy to see um, Toby put an image of the Arms and Armor galleries as they used to be at the Met. Um, so it's something that I remember well also. Um, and then um, if you want to advance one slide, I included an image of the Temple of Dender, which uh, I'm sure you all know is part of most iconic spaces in the Met, obviously the site of many films, and I believe um, their Costume Institute Gala and so forth. Um, but it's also an amazing work of art, the home to a wonderful, um, this ancient Egyptian temple um, created in 15 BC, commissioned by the Emperor Augustus. And brought to New York and installed in the Met um, in the late 1970s. Um, it's, it's just a, it's a beautiful space and, um, you know, one of my sort of earliest memories. And then in terms of thinking about kind of museums as a whole, if you want to move forward one, I was um, very struck from a young age in um, the pieces of graffiti that are inscribed basically all over uh, this temple. Um, you know, it's a little odd and it's definitely not something that I'm encouraging you all, our visitors to think about coming to the Wallace, but um, I think that it impressed on me quite early the idea that works of art have, you know, very complicated afterlives, um, that they travel, that um, people from different cultures might experience them differently. And, you know, that there's sort of this idea of a continuing life and after the time uh, when it leaves the artist's studio or the first patron's house. Um, and I think that that really marked me and kind of set me on my path about thinking of museums as really interesting places to be in. Well, thank you for sharing this with us. Um, I will go back later on to ask you about your art classes as well, but first I just want to ask the curators, like Arthur, do you also have a favorite museum or an early memory of, of museums? Yes, I do. And it's funny, Yuriko, that you should mention these, to bring out these kind of Egyptian holdings of the Met Museum, because um, one of my favorite museums and one that I have the most memories of kind of throughout my life is the the old Egyptian museum in Cairo, um, which is a really it's a wonderful museum. I went first as a as quite a young child, and the kind of the sheer number of large statues, mummies, obviously the death mask of Tutankhamun, um, it's really overwhelming, kind of inspiring. It really I think it's extremely interesting. I think as a child because it's kind of so distant. It's almost like a fantasy land. Um, ancient Egypt. Um, but then as you kind of grow older, you can become more familiar with not just the old Egyptian museum, but also with um, other museums in general. Um, I found it very interesting that it was also kind of a record of how museums develop. Um, for those who have been, um, it's a very old fashioned museum. It was modeled on the British Museum, um, but it's stayed a little kind of stationary, I think, in time. It's since been, quite recently actually, it's moved to a new location and it's been completely redone. So unfortunately you can't see it anymore. Um, but it had this real kind of old grander feeling to it. And it reminds you that a museum isn't a kind of a neutral space to um, show these works of objects. They are really, it, a museum is a specific cultural phenomenon that kind of originated at one point, one place in time and it's kind of spread out since then. And I think it's something very important to be aware of when, when you are in a museum, when you are engaging with kind of the works that are in there. So it's really, yes, I, I'm sad that it's no longer the way it is, but of course, I'm also very happy that they managed to kind of improve and, and relocate the old Egyptian museum. 
Um, yeah, what about you, Natalia? Do you have kind of an earliest memory or something like that of a museum? So, yeah, I do. I was thinking of what was my earliest memory, and um, I'm from Madrid in Spain, and I thought, well, surely it must be the Prado Museum because it makes so much sense. I now spend so much time there. But actually, it isn't at all. It's um, the Altamira Caves in the north of Spain. And um, basically, that's where I've always spent my summer. And the north of Spain, unlike the rest of the peninsula, the weather is awful. It rains all the time. So every single summer, my parents would just put our wellies on, raincoats, and we would walk over to Altamira, which was just over the other side of the hill where we spent the summer. And um, I've just grown up going there every single year. And it's really interesting, as you say, Arthur, because it's I've gone every single year except last year when it was closed because of the pandemic. But I've seen it change throughout time from when uh, the cave, from when Altamira itself was open to when they closed it because um, the, the visitors and um, the exposure to, um, to air was damaging the prehistoric paintings to the building of the museum and the cave reproduction that you visit these days. And I've just seen it evolve and just really seen how um, conservation was um, so key to the formation of this museum. But um, funnily enough, it hasn't had any influence on what I've decided to, to study later on as, a, as an art historian, because I definitely don't know anything about art that was made over 36,000 years ago. Um, but I was wondering, Toby, how did you uh, become to be, how did you come to be interested in arms and armor? Is it also linked to an early event or an early museum visit? Uh, yes, we're, we're already seeing today what happens when you take children to museums. <laughs> Um, and I'm absolutely, I'm certainly no different. Um, I'm from the United States originally also, and um, I spent a lot of time as a child in New York City as well. And I believe that my first visit to the Met uh, was when I was about four. Um, and I did some digging in the archives uh, because I wanted to show you something uh, like what I saw when I was four. The, the Met had a major arms and armor uh, refurbishment and redisplay in the early 1990s, um, which uh, really changed a lot of the way they present things, um, although they're still in this wonderful daylit gallery. But this image, as far as I can tell, was taken in the mid 1970s, uh, around the time that I first went there. And uh, you know, this, this group of mounted knights in the middle of the room just had uh, an awesome effect on me, awesome in the true sense of the word. Um, you know, on the one hand, I was, uh, you know, just you know, completely overawed by the splendor and the size and, of, these, of these things. Um, but on the other hand, I, I immediately felt strangely um, empathetic. And I, I wanted to be up there with them, basically. <laughs> I wanted to be them. You know, this is like instinctual primal communion with art, I guess. Um, and, you know, this is really when the subject of medieval and Renaissance arms and armor grabbed me. Um, and, you know, the rest, the rest is a story of a child's fascination that's gotten completely out of control. <laughs> <laughs> And it's what about you? The, the Mets uh, Arms and Armor Rooms, as Yuriko mentioned as well, are, are year after year voted one of the most popular areas of, of that museum. Um, and it's not as though they lack competition. What about you, Arthur? You're also a curator of Arms and Armor. Did you have a similar experience to Toby's in what made you choose your area of specialism? Funnily enough, not really. Um, originally, I was much more interested in languages. So I, I studied languages at university. Um, I kind of went into art history via, via languages. Um, and for me, what I find so interesting in Arms and Armour and kind of the thing that, you know, 
inspires me to do this kind of work is how closely arms and armor are related to really kind of the physical experience that people had of their environment at the time. It was as an art form, it's very personal. It's worn, worn on, on the person, but it's simultaneously also something that's very public. I mean, of course, no one wears an armor kind of in their own home, you know, quietly unseen. It's very much something that you wear um, out, and, you know, out and about, and it's meant to be seen by others. Um, and especially, I think, for me, because I focus mostly on more the 18th and the 19th century. So times when armor perhaps doesn't really have the same kind of battlefield functionality that it has earlier, of course, with guns around and cannons and all of that. Um, so it really does become much more of a kind of fashion, really, um, for very specific situations. Um, and I find that endlessly fascinating. I think, yes, the kind of identity formation that rolls into that, I think, is just really, really fascinating. That's really fascinating. And I guess with decorative arts, it's also something like arms and armor that you interact with and that are part of your daily life. So Felix, how did you come to be to specialize in decorative arts and what attracted you to these objects rather than to say painting? Yes, thank you. No, I completely agree with what Arthur was saying, um, talking about the interaction with the objects. And that's what I have always found most fascinating about decorative arts. Uh, I've always been interested in interiors, uh, the domestic environment, the relationship between the domestic and the uh, or the private and the public within interiors, um, and decorative arts really has a role in all this. And um, well, basically, to, to give uh, uh, an explanation, if uh, any of our audience don't know necessarily what decorative arts may mean, is um, all that production that uh, escapes uh, the holy uh, trinity of painting, sculpture, and architecture. Um, so everything that uh, goes beyond the, the, what the so-called applied arts, um, and not necessarily arms and armor, obviously. Um, and uh, so this usually includes furniture, ceramics, um, gilt bronze, tapestries, uh, that are many times forgotten and amazing, small, but very intricate and very important objects like the gold box or snuff box that we have here uh, on this slide. And it's really the interaction with the object that I, I think is more fascinating about decorative arts um, because they were meant uh, either to be used or to be uh, held um, uh, quite closely. Um, so, uh, for instance, with this gold box, whether it was really used to be um, carried around and, and to um, take snuff from it, or whether it was just a lovely collectible to handle and look at, uh, one wouldn't just stare at, this, uh, at it as we usually we do with um, painting, sculpture and architecture. You, you hold it, you turn it, you open it, um, and the same would go with um, the other um, uh, aspects that we um, uh, that we label as decorative arts. Um, and uh, well, if, if we go into the um, uh, other uh, image that we have, um, something um, that I also like about decorative arts um, that it may not be as obvious is that because we don't use them when we look at uh, decorative arts from the past, uh, like this um, porcelain piece, we don't use them anymore. So uh, they present a riddle. If we are confronted with something like this, um, we may be able to appreciate uh, the aesthetics of it, but we are going to be quite puzzled um, with uh, how it was really meant to be used from the, uh, from the beginning. And um, that's why I, I love this piece, for instance, because it presents this lovely riddle of what is um, a hen with some chickens on top of what presumably would be a perfume burner. It, it doesn't connect uh, with the, the purpose and um, the decoration of, um, I don't think we can see it here, but on the other side we have uh, some uh, lovely putti that represent the 
sense of smell um, that makes sense with a perfume burner, but not necessarily a hen and chickens. And this is uh, because on top of a perfume burner, this was also probably used as an egg steamer. So you would lift the hen and chickens as, uh, uh, as a lid that removes, and you could put a whole egg inside, uh, then lit up a little fire below. And uh, after a few minutes, you would have a lovely steamed egg. So uh, it's all these uh, layers that you can get with this kind of objects that really makes them so interesting. That's really fascinating. And, and yeah, I completely agree. Um, chickens is not really a perfume I would like to smell at home. <laughs> but since we're talking about how we relate to art and how art is in, in everyday objects, I think uh, this is a good moment to ask you, Yuriko, about the works of art that you have created. And I loved finding out about this. So I hope everyone else enjoys it just as much. Thank you, Natalia. Um, so I don't see it on the screen yet, um, but here is my masterpiece. Hopefully I'll exceed this at some point, but um, this basically is a recycling truck that I designed as part of a commission from the um, uh, city of DC. Um, in an effort to, they solicited uh, designs, um, so it was a competition um, to um, decorate recycling trucks in an effort to get people to think more extensively about um, the environment and the importance of recycling with um, I fully embrace. So I made this a moment, um, this was back in 2015, and it was a moment when I was really getting interested in the implications of um, technical art history and um, non-invasive technical imaging for the study of painting. So, you know, infrared, X-ray, um, hyperspectral images, um, the things that we can um, use to learn about paintings in great depth. Um, and I was also thinking a great deal about, um, you know, kind of the digitization of photographic collections. Um, the institution that I was then a part of was very much on the forefront of trying to make public images of works of art. And so playing around with them and thinking about, you know, kind of, um, I guess, you know, sort of the mistakes and the glitches that kind of arise as much as the, um, you know, when, when an image looks perfect. Um, I, I started to find that very interesting and the kind of, you know, spaces between the creation of these photographs, if you will, um, and the way in which, um, I guess, when things happen in a technical work, you get these colors and sort of repetition of patterns that I found very interesting. And, um, you know, living in DC, I was also quite inspired by the um, Washington Color School, this group of abstract expressionist artists who were, you know, really interested in non-representational works and um, color fields. And also because of my interest in um, old master painting, which is quite representational, I think, you know, I sort of wanted to go in a different direction in my own work um, and got very interested in how a truck like this would look um, covered with colors and patterns, you know, in the urban environment and the idea of putting art into motion, which also, you know, as a paintings person is not something that we can really safely do um, the majority of the time. So this is the result. Um, and here you have a picture that I was able to find of the truck um, barreling down the street. Unfortunately, I think at this point later, it's out of commission. So at some point I'll get to create another one. It's a shame that it's out of commission anyway. I mean, <laughs> Rubbish trucks are usually quite ugly, and this is just so much more pleasant to see driving around than just the typical dirty one. <laughs> Thank you. But um, Toby, you also put theory into practice, and um, I often see you on your on your Instagram that you create your own uh, works of art and your own pieces of armor. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Uh, yeah, if we uh, go to the next slide. Um... As I as I might have um, 
suggested earlier, uh, this is an interest that started as a child for me, um, although its its genesis was not at all a child wanting to be a curator in a museum. Um, it was a child wanting to be a knight. Um, and I'm quite happy to admit that. The, uh, the curatorial life, I, I, I first really wanted to be a curator, I think when I was 12. By that point, I realized that I was gonna have to have a job and some kind of career. And I was scratching my head thinking, how can, how can armor and knights become a career? And you know, museum curator was the obvious, the obvious thing. So at that point, I wrote to the Met and announced myself and uh, told them they should give me a job. Um, but, uh, but you know, when you're a kid pursuing an interest, you, you do whatever you can, whatever is you know, available to you, really. And for me, that was, a, that was always initially practical, practical things, doing things. Um, I, you know, learning to fence, learning to ride a horse, and just you know, fiddling around in the basement. I didn't have a job, so I didn't have money to buy things. And you know, when I was a kid, you couldn't buy armor the way you can now. Now there's a huge living history industry and hundreds of full-time armorers active throughout the world. Uh, but there wasn't when I was a kid. So I had to make, you know, make things. Um, and there's always been a, a practical side to the way I approach my subject. You know, even in a, you know, in a museum context, you're dealing in arms and armor with uh, objects that are practical equipment for fighting, uh, as well as at the same time, it's an expressive art form. Uh, it's a process that actually transforms the artist's patron into a living artwork. And the expressive power and the meaning of, of these objects though, is kind of dependent on and constantly referring to the function. You know, there is no meaning without the, the practical aspect. That's where it all kind of flows from. So as a curator in this area, I feel that you know, I need to have a practical awareness as well as, as, well as an academic um, pursuit. So this is, you know, I've built a number of armors over the years and, and um, you know, fought in armor and helped establish a kind of competitive international community uh, of people who want to pursue the you know, fighting martial arts of the, of the Renaissance. We just go to the, the next one. Um, so that, so there, are, there are competitive tournaments that happen internationally now um, where uh, you know, there's a lot of historical research that goes into it and sets of 15th and 16th century rules for formal combats are followed. Um, and after sort of 25 or 30 years of development, you know, the results from a, a, a historically accurate point of view are, are pretty good now. Um, this is a, a, a longsword, armored longsword um, tournament that I took part in in Italy a couple of years ago. Um, we carry on. Um, so, I, so there is, you know, with all of this equipment, you know, you need you need to know how it works and you need a lot of different skills um, to maintain one's equipment and, and to, 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 to make new gear. Um, so mail making was something that I taught myself to do when I was 12 or 13 years old. Um, and I, it's just something that I've sort of grown into and I find it a very, very relaxing kind of thing to do in front of the television or whatever. Um, and uh, if we just go to the last one, um, and it's just this, from a hands-on point of view, from a, a practical point of view, uh, there's all kinds of skills that I've picked up over the years, um, just needing to fix saddles, just leather work. Uh, and all of that kind of adds up to uh, perhaps a greater empathy with the lives of you know, people hundreds of years ago. And that's a lot about what our job is about. How do we take objects and works of art and and, and find a way to help our visitors commune with their ancestors. Uh, at a place like the Wallace Collection, certainly that's, that's what it's all about. And, and I found that my practical pursuits helped me speak about the museum collection uh, more effectively. Uh, that's fascinating. Um, it's kind of funny to think about making uh, male 
arm uh, um, as if you were doing a bit of crochet in front of the TV. <laughs> um, but Felix, you mentioned earlier that um, the Holy Trinity of art is kind of, and as we often see it is painting, sculpture and architecture. And as Toby has said, the armor, arms and armor falls outside of that. And so do the decorative arts. And I remember at university, we hardly ever spoke about decorative arts. So why would, why would you say it's so important? How would you explain decorative arts to the uninitiated? Um, so, well, it's absolutely true. When I was at the university, we barely touched on the decorative arts um, and it was only um, during a, a year of studies uh, in Paris that I got to learn what that was because they had courses specifically dedicated to the decorative arts. And uh, it really connects in a way to what Toby was saying just now, um, the craftsmanship behind these subjects um, is completely amazing. It means that um, they were people that they were absolute specialists on doing something very, very specific. And to be able to get a complete object, um, whether it is furniture or porcelain, you would have not just one, but a relatively large team of specialists, depending on the complexity of, of the object. And um, uh, I, I imagine it would be something similar with uh, arms and armor. And um, so going back to, uh, uh, to this idea of the, the importance and the specialization, um, I think it's kind of agreed that at least when it comes to porcelain, um, furniture, uh, gilt bronze, one of the um, highest uh, levels of craftsmanship that um, we have ever attained. It was during the 18th century in France, in particular in, in Paris. Um, and um, this is very interesting because there was this perfect storm that allowed this to happen. So it all started at the end of the 17th century with Louis XIV's interest in refurbishing and um, uh, sort of redecorating the royal palaces with the utmost splendor uh, because he wanted his court to be the shiniest court uh, that had ever existed. Uh, and he saw the use of decorative arts as, as a great um, PR campaign or, or way of conveying this propaganda. Uh, so um, with the creation of state manufactories, um, new uh, manufactories were uh, sort of um, implemented in Paris where uh, craftsmen would uh, create tapestries and furniture and other objects that would use uh, would be used to decorate interiors or royal interiors such as the Gobelin uh, manufactory. And then um, during the 18th century, uh, this was combined to uh, an increasing search for comfort uh, at home uh, by the ruling classes. Uh, so that um, uh, brought all these different varieties of different types of furniture, sitting furniture and so on. Um, uh, and um, absolute obsession with following fashion and uh, outdoing each other with the latest fashions, uh, which created a craze, almost like a, a shopping craze or a redecorating craze uh, in the uh, ruling classes. Um, the incredibly wealthy um, uh, financiers uh, and, and the, the financial elite, uh, plus also the aristocracy that could afford these objects because refurbishing not, not even a house, refurbishing a whole room uh, would have been incredibly expensive once you start counting on the silk that you need to put on the walls, uh, the um, uh, furniture um, with all its trimming, if it's sitting furniture and so on, and then all the uh, little objects that you would want to add. And that's, you even think of hanging any paintings around that room. So um, it necessitated um, very deep pockets uh, from the, the different clients. Um, and, uh, and then ultimately, I think it was also the charm of Paris and the allure of Paris and uh, the court of Versailles that was almost a gravitational point for craftsmen 
not just from France, but also from other countries that they would come and they would grow and thrive in this um, sort of creative and very extensive stock. And um, that's why some of the objects um, that we consider to be absolute masterpieces in their furniture or ceramics tapestries, they are um, originally from uh, Paris in the 18th century. I think we're very lucky at the Wallace that we can get a snippet into what that world might have been like. But exactly. it still feels like very remote. So Yuriko, you're also a specialist in 18th century France, but in paintings. Do you have any film recommendations or book recommendations that might help us learn a bit more about the area? Um, yes. So if I move forward um, to the next slide. Um, it's true that you know, here I feel like talk about the field with so many tales so passionately, I think it's hard to think of this era as being remote or out of touch. Um, but since we can't all have Felix um, with us um, at all points, I, I do have a couple of recommendations to people who are interested in getting this kind of flavor of the 18th century that um, I think um, you were so beautifully evoking, Felix. So my first, um, and forgive me because this is a bit, um, of a um, cliche, but I do think that uh, Sofia Coppola's film, Marie Antoinette is um, quite good at evoking the emotions of, you know, this young queen living in this court um, alongside the texture of the kind of luxury and excess that she um, basically throws herself into as an escape from you know, feeling of being kind of I think trapped by the etiquette of her daily life. Um, you know, we've, I think many people have talked about this film and this sort of little moment of when you try on all of these shoes and then you see in the background um, this Congress. So obviously quite anachronistic, but really that kind of reminds us that she's a very young girl at this point. Um, and, um, also, I think a really good use of a contemporary soundtrack that, again, brings sort of life in this period. So those of us at the Wallace Collection, our sins will all be here with the shoes in this film, because if you want to move forward one slide, um, I think I probably don't need to remind our visitors that we had an exhibition recently of the same shoes that are in the film, um, where were displayed in a little drawing room. Um, so it was quite interesting because we had shoes from various eras of Manolo Blahnik's career. Um, he designed the shoes working with Sofia Coppola for this film. And as part of our collaboration with him, he lent us the exact shoes that had been used in the film and the ones that are in this space. And it was quite funny because whereas all of the other shoes that we had on display were, you know, perfect sample size, never before out of the box or worn, you could sort of see in the ones displayed in this room, which had been used and you know, worn by Kristen Dunst and her friends. Um, little signs of wear, grass stains, because they're worn when uh, they're running through the grass um, in the scenes that place at the Petit Trianon, or little you know, wear and tear um, on the satin of the shoes, which I, and I think gives maybe another sense of nuance to what we've been talking about, this idea of these works being you know, meant to be worn or used or enjoyed in a paper way. Um, I also enjoyed the film because if you want to move forward one slide again, it does evoke the role of painting in 18th century France. Um, so my next slide, which I don't see, oh, here it is. Um, it does evoke this very close relationship that Marie Antoinette had with the artist Elisabeth Louise de Lebrun, who was one of the most important portraitists of the era, also an artist who's represented at this collection. Do necessarily a great job in um, replicating one of her 
most famous works. She did a number, a number of portraits of Queen Mary Antoinette. I'm showing you the real one, on the um, right of my slide, and then um, the one that they use in the film and they substituted Christmas features. But I think that it was a sort of, it's not the whole film, but there is a kind of nice nod to this relationship between these two women and between the Queen and her favorite portraitist. Um, and that's also a relationship that's evoked in the other film that I wanted to mention, um, which is called Farewell, My Queen. It's a French film. Um, and it, again, talks about the sort of last days of Mary Antoinette at Versailles. Um, rather, I think, more serious um, and more somber than... Um, than the Sofia Coppola film, but again, a really sort of interesting evocation of the psychology of this queen who, who knows that she's on her way out, essentially. Um, and there is a um, vignette where um, she's, you know, in her private chambers and we see one of the famous portraits of her, um, in this case, a work by the artist Drury. So those are two films I'd recommend. Um, in terms of books, do you want to move forward on? I think that Hillary Mantle's A Place of Your Safety is really um, this is a book that I mail folks as opposed to as I mentioned, and it is gory, so it's yourselves. Um, but it talks about the relationship between Camille Desmoulins, Georges Danton, and um, uh, Maximilian Rose Pierre, um, who all, it turns out, knew each other quite well and uh, were really interlinked on a personal and familial level. Um, and of course, you know, come to this really tremendous clash um, that leads to the execution of Tonton and um, Desmoulins in a really tragic way, um, where Rose Pierre sort of takes over fully asserts his authority um, as the revolution is leaning into the period of the terror. It's a very long book, um, but it's completely gripping and I think again, get a very good um, sense of the personalities behind this history. Because one thing I think that I've definitely learned from this conversation and that I'm sure that our um, audience has as well is that I think we're all pretty much driven by finding out what these people's lives was actually like, you know, no matter what era we're studying or no matter what um, media we specialize in. I think that really kind of understanding the history better and the culture is a driving force for all of us. So, well, Thank you. That's really interesting. And I'm, I'm definitely taking notes of what books I, <laughs> I would like to uh, read. Um, a bit of greater safety is a good read for the end of August. Um, as I said, a bit gore, but it's gripping. So. Good to curl up on or sit on the beach. Thank you. Yeah, I do find it interesting that um, what you've mentioned about us wanting to find out more about uh, the people that live in these times and the historical context, because that is exactly what drove me to um, specialize in, in Spanish art, which is the collections of Spanish art outside Spain tend to be small. Um, there are not usually very many Spanish paintings in museums, but I, having studied in a French school and then in an English university, there were um, what we learned about Spain was always very much tainted by the black legend. And um, but then I thought I I always learned that Spain was interconnected with all the great European powers. So I wanted to learn more about something that having studied in the English uh, system was not, um, we didn't talk about very much. So that's what drove me to specialize in, in Spanish art. And so for example, one of my favorite works at the Wallace collection is this tiny little panel by um, Memling in the 16th century gallery downstairs. And it was one of the reasons why I love it so much is because um, we think that it was in the collection of Margaret of Austria who was uh, Emperor Charles V and, and um, she had been married to uh, Isabella of Castile's um, son. 
Philip, the, the handsome man, had lived in in Spain. And then when she moved back to the Netherlands, she became the um she ruled on behalf of Charles V. Uh the she ruled the Spanish Netherlands and she amassed this incredible collection that was very much shaped in taste by what Isabella of Castile liked, uh, which were or not Spanish artists, but artists that came from Northern Europe, but that were very popular in the Iberian Peninsula at the time. And all these links between the tiny Spain on the corner of Europe and the rest of Europe, I always found really interesting. Um, but yeah, this is just to show my favorite work of art in the collection. And um, Felix, what, what is your favorite uh, work of art in the collection? Um, so, well, I was asked that question um, in my interview a couple of years ago, and I just didn't blink because I had it very clear that it was um, the chest of drawers that we are going to be showing now. There it is. Um, so this chest of drawers that probably many of you know uh, and is in the back state room. Um, I just thought that with a single object, you can explain and cover a whole era. And this is the reign of Louis XV, the um, era that is usually associated with the Rococo. And it's so powerful when you can look at a single object and, um, and you can just start unpicking uh, so many threads uh, from the, uh, the history of the object and what it means, what it says. And um, yes, I think that if there was ever an object that would encompass everything that this period means, um, it could be very well this chest of drawers um, that um, it was delivered for uh, the private bedroom of Louis XV at Versailles in 1739. So when the Rococo was just starting uh, to be um, an absolute unavoidable um, style in, in France. And uh, it just uh, also has going back to what we were saying, it talks about um, how complicated uh, delivering something so seemingly so banal as a chest of drawers that right now we could just pick it um, almost from any store. Um, and um, if you want to deliver the best for the most important person in the kingdom, well, this is a huge process that requires um, um, Carpenter, an Evanist, uh, a bronze maker, a gilder, the person that supplies um, the, um, uh, the marble slab, and obviously a designer as well. And what is very interesting uh, for this chest of drawers is that we conserve what we think it is the original design um, that is just slightly different, but still very similar in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. And uh, it's quite rare to uh, conserve designs um, after works of art that are um, about 300 years ago. So um, yes, um, it definitely, uh, I find that this is a very exciting piece and, and something that I also like about it is that apart from being able to tell so much about a period, uh, a way of living um, and a way of making art, um, it just has an almost physical um, reaction in me. It's just so exciting to look at something like this, that there is so much to look at at the same time, and you're almost fighting within yourself that trying to constrain everything into one single glance, but it's absolutely impossible because every detail leads into another one. So uh, this excitement of looking at an object and seeing something new every time, uh, it really has a big impact on me. It really is an amazing object. And the Wallace collection is full of objects like this. But, um, well, we're coming to the end of the talk now. So I'll just ask one more question for Arthur, which is slightly different. Um, if you were, if you could add anything to the Wallace collection, what object would you add? It's a it's a really fun question to think about. Um, of course, the Wallace collection is not allowed to, or hasn't been allowed, as a closed collection. It's not allowed to um, acquire anything or the accession anything, um, and so it's completely unchanged from um, the nineteenth century. 
when it was put together, the at least the um, Indian and Iranian arms and armor, um, it was very much put together with a kind of a European eye as to what constitute arms and armor and what what what's kind of outside of that scope. Um, and so we have very many helmets and shields and and van braces, so arm guards, um, from uh, late 18th and then 19th century Iran. And what's interesting is that these were all used for a type of religious ceremony called a tazia, uh, which is kind of a passion play. It involves actors in armor, essentially, quite a, quite a few of them. And it's a really wonderful collection. And it would be a really, I would really like to be able to tell that story of Tazia um, with that collection. But unfortunately, what we're missing really, the kind of the key um, thing that we're missing, and I don't know if we have a slide for that. Um, let me, it, it's a, a kind of a battle standard, essentially. These are standards that were original. So this is only one, one half of kind of the full one. Um, I think this one is in the Met. Um, it's also slightly earlier. Um, but these are, um, they're modeled on battle standards and they are carried around in the procession. They're also used in the play. Um, and why, the reason I would love to have one of these with the collection is that they also, they are made by the same craftspeople who make the armors. Um, they often feature kind of design choices here. You've got pierced steel, um, which you also see in, in the armors. So they're really very related. I think from a purely kind of Iranian point of view, it doesn't really make sense to have only the helmets and the shields and the arm guards, but not these, these battle standards. So I feel like that would kind of complete it in, in, in a way and be, allow us to tell that story. Thank you. So this brings us to the end of our talk, but of course we have time for more questions. So. If you would like to ask us anything else, please do write them in the Q&A. Thank you. Yes, a huge thank you to, uh, to everyone today for, for joining us and of course to all of our curators as well. We're, we're lucky we've, we've had one question in, uh, so far on our Q&A, uh, which is, is for Toby. Um, so kind of a big question here, Toby, but uh, how do you make mail? Uh, I don't know how long you'd like to <laughs> spend on that one. <laughs> well, um... Mail is, uh, I mean, in the most general sense, mail is a metal fabric, really, that's made up of thousands of interlocking steel or iron or otherwise metal links uh, or rings. Um, and it's a, it's a technology that uh, evolved spontaneously and independently in uh, several different parts of the world in, in different periods in history. Um, that's the nature of a clever idea. Sooner or later, more than one person is going to have it independently. Um, and mail, it, it, it's, um, it's a wonderful answer to some of the basic design problems with how to, involved in how to uh, protect the human body. Uh, you know, protection comes at a cost. And the cost is being able to move and um, being comfortable. And the greater your protection, uh, the greater is uh, your restriction and your discomfort. So how do you, how, how do you protect a moving, uh, flexible human body with metal? Uh, Mail is one of the, is a very old answer to that problem. It, um, uh, it appeared in around 300 BC, as far as we can tell, as an invention of Northwestern Europeans, uh, then a technology hijacked by the Romans and then proliferating throughout everywhere. Uh, it also appeared in a slightly different form in Japan and China and various other places. Uh, the, typical, the typical European pattern uh, for making mail and we weaving patterns do vary is that you have one link and every, every individual link is connected to four others, uh, two above and two below. Um, and when you uh, start connecting these clusters of five into strips, you get these alternating rows. Uh, so the, the rows kind of alternate like that. Um, 
and uh, you just keep going until you have enough material to do whatever it is that you want to do. Um, and uh, you can increase the protective quality of the male by making the links uh, thicker, heavier, uh, smaller, denser, uh, very much like cloth. You know, you, you know, textile can be wildly different in weight and behavior, depending on what kind of threads you use to weave it. Uh, and it's very much the same with male. So on the one on the right here, um, if you can see that the, the collar of this piece I made for a, a, a feature film that's coming out next year, um, the, the collar is actually a much denser weave of six in one. So every link has six others going through it rather than four. And then you go down to a, a more open four in one weave in the, uh, in the mantle so that um, different parts of the garment have different protective and flexible qualities. Um, and, uh, you know, that, I mean, there, there's different weaves in different places. The Japanese make, uh, make mail in, in quite a different way, but it has the same sort of um, ultimate function. Uh, and it's a, it's a very successful technology. It never really went away. Uh, it's still used by, you know, fishmongers in Smithfield Market. Uh, in London uh, who wear male gloves because they're working all day very quickly with sharp knives. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a professional hazard to cut your fingers off. So wearing male gloves is an easy way to deal with that. They also often wear male aprons uh, for the same reasons. Uh, and marine biologists now also wear male when they're diving with dangerous marine species like uh, sharks and various biting um, uh, squids and things. Um, so and when I was a kid, this was an easy thing to teach myself how to do. It, it seemed easy once I knew how to do it, I suppose. Um, but uh, and I just uh, I just carried on. And it's a, now it's a scholarly interest as well. When I'm looking at original 15th or 16th century mail in the museum and at the Wallace, I can immediately see what the makers are doing. I can immediately pick up on uh, repairs or instances where a new garment was made out of older recycled pieces, or whether when a set of male sleeves was actually cut out of an old male shirt. You know, again, that practical hands-on experience, you know, can mean a lot um, when, you're, when you're studying historical objects. Well, thank you very much, Toby. That's uh, quite an in-depth answer for quite a, a large question, I think. And uh, yeah, glad to hear you've been uh, busy in front of the, front of the TV and over lockdown, maybe. Uh, we've had a few messages in uh, from, uh, from people in the chat and the uh, Q&A just to say thank you uh, so much for today's talk. Uh, so many people have enjoyed uh, from, from all over. Uh, we've also had a message uh, from BT who uh, has said, uh, I somehow, oh, sorry, right, uh, and somehow I find the concept of a closed collection very reassuring, uh, although I would like to provide Arthur with a, a standard. So uh, you never know, Arthur, maybe there's uh, one, one that you can uh, hang on to there. Uh, I'll just have a little look and see if we've got any more coming through. Uh, just a few more to say uh, thank you. Uh, we do have a question. Again, I think this might be a follow-up perhaps on the mail uh, from Joy asking, how heavy would the, uh, the collar be? Uh, I don't know if you can give us a, a quick answer on that one, Toby. The, the brass collar? Um, I, uh, I haven't weighed it. Um, I think it, lays, it weighs less than a kilo. Um, you know, if making armor of any sort is always, you know, again, um, try, you, there has to be a, enough metal there to do the job and to protect you, but you don't want to be carrying any more weight than is absolutely necessary. Um, so hence why I've only used the six in one weave on the collar, but not the mantle. That's about weight efficiency as well as um, mobility. So I always try to, to, to minimize the, the weight, um, but that, I think it, it, it weighs, you know, maybe a, a pound, something like that, if I'm allowed to mix material <laughs> and metric. We'll let you off, I think. Uh, yeah. but just before we close, I wonder um, if any of our other, other curators, um, do you ever get involved in your sort of specialism? Yuriko, do you, do you pick up a paintbrush from time to time? Or, or Felix, have you ever turned your hand to carpentry? I have taken painting classes, but it's not something that I'm um, doing currently, sadly. But Felix, um, do you do anything in the way of the decorative arts? 
Um, well, I also took painting classes for many years when I was um, growing up, um, but I've only attempted um, uh, at making some ceramics once, and, and it was a great experience. I think the the thing with the decorative arts is that, well, apart from the specialism, is not as spontaneous probably as grabbing some paints or some colors, or uh, you probably need more uh, equipment and, and it's, it's just not as easy to find uh, places, but, um, but definitely it really helps uh, mm -hmm. to look closely. So we, we work very closely with conservation. So even though we are not involved in the conservation of process, we see conservation processes um, very uh, closely and it makes such a big difference to, to see how things are made, how they need to be treated, um, because it, it's just a great understanding of the object that just by looking at it in a gallery, you don't necessarily have. Absolutely. So Ali, if you, um, if the learning team is thinking of offering studio art classes, I think we'll be, we'll all be takers. Definitely, yeah. By the sounds of thing, Felix, you need a, uh, a potter's wheel on your Christmas list as well, I think. <laughs> I think we're just about running out of time for today. So uh, just a final thank you to, uh, to all of our audience who've joined from home and for all of our, our questions and comments uh, we've had. And it's always lovely to have feedback uh, during our talk. Uh, and of course, a thank you to all five of our curators today uh, for what has been a, a really a real treat, I think, a really fantastic talk in our programme. Uh, don't forget to join us uh, next month, of course, for our, our Meet the Expert programme, uh, where Arthur will be joining us again uh, to talk about uh, one of our Iranian uh, armors, I believe, Arthur. Uh, so very much looking forward to that. Um, and uh, the links can be found for that, of course, uh, via what's on, on the website and uh, YouTube as well. So I look forward to uh, seeing many of you there next month. Uh, otherwise, have a lovely afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you.